Sarah, have you seen the new collection from our sponsor, Vionic? It's called Vionic Vitals, and it offers some of Vionic's best essential styles for everyday wear to help you get ready for the spring, which is not that far off, by the way. The Willa Slip-On Flat is in the Vitals collection, and I have to say, I have a pair of Willas, and they are one of my favorites. This shoe has classic and classy loafer styling with a seriously supportive footbed, and they come in over 12 colors to complement any outfit. I've also got a pair of Vionic's Uptown Loafers on the way, which I'm really excited about because they collapse flat for packing. I'll definitely get a ton of use out of those when I'm traveling this spring. I know, and that feature is so smart. Well, Megan, I am also very excited about the Vionic Vitals collection. These are versatile daily wear styles that feel as good as they look. Yeah, and let's talk about that comfort, Sarah. Vionic actually got started by revolutionizing medical orthotics. Today, they continue to use that science to engineer shoes that are super cute and also feel great on your feet. Vionic even offers a 30-day guarantee. Wear your shoes, love them, or return for a full refund within 30 days. Use code THEMOMHOUR15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's one-time use only. Vionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Hi, I'm Megan. And I'm Sarah. We're two moms with eight kids between us, and we're the hosts of The Mom Hour. On this show, we're joined by a team of unique mom voices from across the country and in different stages of motherhood to bring you tips, ideas, and encouragement, and to help you feel a little less alone. We all know that motherhood is a lot easier when real moms share honest truths and remind each other that it's all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to The Mom Hour. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 448 of The Mom Hour. I'm Megan Francis here with Sarah Powers. Hey, Sarah. Happy New Year, Megan, officially. Happy New Year to you. A little, you know, like midway into the month. That's okay. Um, We have not recorded, like we have not physically sat down and done what we're doing right this moment in a month. Yeah. So if you've been listening to the January episodes so far, we're just pulling back the curtain. Those were recorded in 2023, last year. So it is Happy New Year because we have not done this yet in 2024. And there's nothing I'd rather do. I'm just happy to be here with you today. I am happy to be here too. Um, I love that we can get so far ahead, especially going into a busy holiday season. And we both had like, not even overlapping, but basically just never ending. I feel like different family things. I had kids, adult kids coming and going and coming and going. And then, (laughs) and then you and your family were just going. We went, we, we stayed, we stayed, and then we went. So, um, and that ties right into what we're talking about today. So yeah, my family of five, our nuclear family, um, went abroad. We went across the pond to London, the UK and a little bit of Paris. And I'm going to talk some more about that today and just some, I guess, little parenting and family life ahas that I had along the way, um, as well as just share some stories from our trip. So Our holiday was like normal until it wasn't. We were home. We had a lovely Christmas at home. We did kind of the usual things with the family who lives here. And then on December 26th, we flew across the pond and we didn't get back till January 5th. So I do. I as we record this, I am very much still in reentry, complete with lingering jet lag, lingering colds, the whole nine yards. I don't feel January ish yet as of this recording. Yeah. And you had said that you basically got home and found Christmas suspended. Yeah. Oh, at yeah. Your house. Yeah. Because While you had a migraine, I believe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The travel like really. Yeah. It, it triggers <laughs> it really my headache. Messed you up. Yeah. I, I mean, the tree is still up as as of this recording. And that's really late for me, but that's OK. I will unpack this today. We'll um we'll explore all of the ups and downs of like these big family trips and I'm going to say more ups than downs. So I will take my disheveled house and my jet lagged, bedraggled family um, because we had a really great trip. So Sarah was sending me, you know, pretty regular check ins when you, you know, it's not like you were completely disconnected. This is 2024 and you were able to send me messages while you were gone. So I kind of had a sense of what you were doing, like what your itinerary was. Mm -hmm. I feel like you were really good at checking in. And just saying, today we're taking this train and we're going to be doing this or we're going to be doing that. But you're really going to be digging into some of the stuff I don't think we did talk about, which is sort of like, yeah, like what you learned about, like what maybe you either knew already, but was um, solidified 
by watching your family yeah. go through this experience together. So I'm excited about that. Before we get into that, I am really curious, Sarah, you had a weirdly long winter break, like maybe longer than I've ever heard of before. Had you not had that long winter break and you tried to do this, the trip, the length that you did, how would you have felt about it? Either when you were leaving town or like, would you have just felt like it was crazy pants or would it have been okay? Well, I think we would have had to make decisions around the Christmas holiday. So the way this came together is, yeah, our school district decided to do a three week break from school this year, which is really unheard of around here. I don't know why it's that's a whole separate conversation. I'm not a huge fan. But when I looked at the calendar, I realized we could have a week at home and be cozy and do Christmas at home and then still have two more weeks to do something. And that really gave me the impetus and inspiration to take the leap on a big trip like this. If we'd had two weeks of break, I'm, I might still have done an 11, 10, 11 day trip, but we would have like spent Christmas away from our family or it would have impacted other things that I enjoy doing over yeah. the holidays. So something would have had to give, I guess. Yeah. So you wouldn't have been able to have the experience that Sarah likes to have. Yeah. Yeah. During the holiday, but you could have, you could have still done it. I mean, I just thought, wow, three weeks, that's pretty unheard of, but, um, but it's not like a trip like that would have been out of the question without that third week. It just would have, you would have had to make some other choices. Yeah, exactly. And, and the other thing is we chose to come home Friday night before the kids went back to school and Brian went back to work on Monday. And I thought that should be a good amount of time to get the, like the worst of the jet lag behind us and get some laundry done. And it was barely enough time. So I think, um, other Fam- families other than me might even have added another couple of days and fly home on Sunday and go back to work on Monday. That would not have worked for me. So fr- like a Friday coming home was already kind of pushing it because the reentry has been, yeah. been rough, but it's been pretty rough. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard about it secondhand and it's, not, yeah. it's been rough for me, Sarah. It's been yeah, rough for me. You're tired of hearing about it. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. So I do have one more question for you and this is a little more, um, high level, I guess. <laughs> 30,000 feet in the sky Mm -hmm. level um, question for you. And, and I'm just going to selfishly lean on my own experience this Christmas, having more kids launched than I have had in the past and a lot of, and then also in brand new family um, that I am, you know, I'm trying to do a lot of accommodating the other day. I thought, man, I am just ready for a break from accommodating other people. Mm -hmm. It's been a lot of that. And one of the things I realized that I think can be kind of exacerbated or really illuminated, I'm going to guess, by a stressful, even if it's a positive stress uh, situation like international travel, is how hard I try to make everyone else not have to be uncomfortable. Like, Mm -hmm. that's a thing for me. Um, And how I will engineer Christmas so that no one else ever has to be disappointed or uncertain Mm -hmm. or anything like that. And even on just a very small scale this year, I was like, wow, that kind of doesn't work anymore. There's too many moving parts. There's too many adult people. There's new family members. Like I sort of have to let people be uncomfortable and disappointed. And that was kind of an aha moment for me. So I'm going to guess you experienced something like that at some point. Yes, absolutely. And I went in a little nervous about that. I think I, I worked really hard on the planning of this trip and I just thought, I hope I can let go of, of my control issues, enjoy the trip, but also not be so triggered when a kid inevitably is just grumpy because they're a teenager or doesn't like the food or doesn't like is bored by some attraction that we've paid for. And it's not, they don't understand the money. Like they don't care. It doesn't matter to them. I was almost more, a little more apprehensive about my own ability to manage my feelings about that than I was with, oh, now I'm sad that they're disappointed or they're bored or they're grumpy. So I, I will say I was pleasantly surprised, um, both at how the kids rose to the occasion and really weren't as, as grumpy as I thought they might be about certain things. Um, and also how I was able to roll with stuff, but it did make me think like travel like this is it's the ultimate tension in like the individual versus the collective. And I think anyone who's gone camping or gone on a road trip, like, you know, that, that the tension of which I speak is like, 
each individual is going to have needs. Someone's going to need to stop for the bathroom. Someone's going to need like to eat a meal or have a snack. Someone's not going to want to partake of a certain museum or a certain thing. And I think raising kids at these ages, my kids are uh, 10, 13, and 15. I, I want them to start to come into their own desires to be able to advocate for themselves. I have kids who, who tend more toward people pleasing than they do mm. being squeaky wheels. So I actually, I actually do want them to learn to advocate for their needs and, and listen to their bodies and what they need. At the same time, sometimes you got to suck it up. Like sometimes we're going to do this thing. And I guess all of parenting is a little like this, but I just found this heightened sense of like a natural tension between how, how do everybody's actual needs get met? And then beyond their actual needs, how do we balance everybody's wanting to have, wanting to get the most out of this very meaningful vacation, which sometimes means sacrificing your desires in the, for the good of the whole. And sometimes means four people kind of set aside their desires. So one person can have their dream meal or something. It's just, it's tricky. It is tricky. And I have realized that I'm, uh, sometimes to a, well, it's a, it's a people pleasing, um, tendency in myself to want everyone else to want to do for the collective, like ah, to expect everyone yeah. to do for the collective. And you really notice, I would, I'm going to guess in a situation like international travel is one way you might really notice that tendency. I noticed it a lot this year doing blended family stuff because I feel a lot of pressure to make my family like show up yeah. for the, for the whole. Right. And, and have to remind myself, well, this is their vacation too. Like they're allowed to hang out in their room. Yeah. And it's just different when, when you're in your home with your family of origin, with the way you've done Christmas every year for, you know, decades, you don't notice it as much as when you're in a different environment. So I can, I can, and also with you, there was like the time limited nature of it and the specialness of it and the money that was spent. It all heightens it. Exactly. Exactly. Sarah, you know, when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies, but having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. Megan, it's hard to believe it, but for plan ahead types like me, spring is right around the corner and that means warmer weather and more time on the go. Today, we're talking about the Vionic Vitals collection from our longtime sponsor, Vionic Shoes. These are the best essential styles for everyday wear to get you ready for the season. There's the Uptown Loafer, a super cute, chunky loafer that comes in 10 different colors and collapses flat for easy packing. And there's also the Chardonnay Heeled Sandal, which I just ordered a pair of in a bright cherry red. I don't wear heels a ton anymore, but when I do, they are always Vionic because they're just so comfortable. Yeah, and I was excited to see that the Willa Slip-On Flat is part of the Vitals collection because I have those in a bright blue and they're so much fun. Elevate your wardrobe with Vionic Vitals, a meticulously crafted collection with daily wear styles designed for comfort and versatility. And of course, the entire collection features Vionic's exclusive Viomotion technology, which is what makes their shoes so comfortable and supportive. The company actually got their start by revolutionizing medical orthotics. And then, lucky us, they just continued that right into fashion footwear. They even offer a 30-day guarantee so you can wear them, love them, or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code THEMOMHOUR15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one-time use only. Bionic Shoes. 
wearable well-being for your feet. Okay, Megan, I'm just going to kind of launch in. Like we said at the top, we're not going to go through my itinerary day by day. This is not a like help you plan your London and Paris vacation podcast. That'll be another thing. Yeah, maybe. Maybe (laughs) it'll be a blog post. No, it's it's more about kind of like the parenting ahas and the family ahas I had whilst traveling, whilst being one of my favorite um, British words. Of course. Yes, naturally. I'm going to start with the pearls of wisdom that occurred to me that are very specific to travel and tourism. And then a little later, we'll broaden that to just things that I think apply all the time. Um, But these are more tourism specific. And the first one is that less is more when seeing something for the first time that might be big or overwhelming, or you might have uh, grand expectations. And and so for us, this was the Louvre Museum in Paris. Um, I have been to the Louvre once before, and Brian had been before. And for those who maybe can't draw up a mental image of it, it is enormous. I think it's the second largest museum of any kind in the world. It's miles and miles and miles of things to see. Um, What I had never done in a museum like this is have a guided tour. And we did one, not because I thought it would be so amazing, but because it was the only way to gain entry. All the tickets had been sold out by the time we knew, (laughs) by the time, not that day, I mean, not not upon our arrival, but by the time I knew which day we were going to be able to go to the Louvre, all of the entry tickets were sold out. It ended up being New Year's Eve. And the only way in was to buy a semi-private tour um, through like an independent tour guide agency. Um, It was a six-person tour. There were five of us, and the sixth person ended up like peeling off and doing their own thing. So we basically got a private tour of the Louvre, which was really, really cool. By private, I mean, there were like a million other people there, but we were following this guy around. And here's where the less is more comes in. Um, If I had taken my kids to the Louvre, I would have felt probably so overwhelmed. I would have looked at the little map or, you know, gotten an app or something and probably headed to the Mona Lisa like everybody does and then wandered around some galleries. I like art museums, but I, I don't feel particularly focused when I'm in them. Yes, I totally agree. And it can feel like you're not getting your I don't want to say money's worth, but your effort's worth or something like you're not appreciating it uh, to its fullest potential. And then that doesn't feel good. Right. And then you feel like you have paid. So you want to hit every floor or every gallery or every room. So what Sean, our amazing tour guide, shout out Sean, what he did was he took us, I wish I had counted, but I'm going to say maybe 12 stops. It was an hour and a half tour. And really we would walk into a room or a gallery he would give us a little bit of context about where we were and some general things. And then we would stop at like one painting or one sculpture in that area. And he would tell us a story for a good 10 minutes. The kids were interacting with him. We were looking at up close at detail. He was giving us all kinds of kind of anecdotal, cultural and historical perspective. And then we would move on to the next gallery. And Megan, we were the amount of things I did not look at in the Louvre is astonishing. I really feel like we went through that museum and we saw 12 things and it was the best possible choice for our family because we got so much um, rich information about those 12 things. And when I say we didn't look at anything else, of course, we're looking around as we're walking through the building's incredible, like the whole visual experience is incredible, but I didn't feel pressure to know anything about the 10 million pieces of art we didn't focus on. And I'm, I wouldn't have designed it that way. That was a happy accident. I just going to say that I am someone who does not like the idea of guided tours. They make me itchy. You know me. I just, I'll be like, ugh, someone's going to tell me what to look at. Like I don't get to do it my way. And, but every time I've done a guided tour, almost like almost without exclusion, it's been worth it because it takes that I'm just wandering around staring at stuff feeling out of it. And especially if you're with your kids in a huge place that where you don't even know where to start or yeah. like, what am I even looking at? That's so helpful. And then you don't have to see everything. You just saw the stuff like you. You had an experience. Yeah. And we yeah. will remember the things he taught us and that we talked about. And I don't think 
I don't I don't know that we would have remembered if we tried to get that zoomed out. Like, let's make sure we hit all the galleries and look at all the things. And and so I I guess I don't know because this is the way it ended up happening. But it really felt like a powerful takeaway of, yes, it's true that we missed a lot in the Louvre, but I feel like we're going to remember more. And Violet got a little bored at the end, but the other two kids were not bored the entire time. And I think they would have been bored if we had just kind of wandered through looking around. I think sometimes you can get that experience too if you don't have something booked in advance. If there's like someone, if you go into a museum or something and there's someone standing around that looks official, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you can kind of ask them a question and they might also help give some context. I'm thinking about when the kids and I went to um, St. Augustine last spring break. We went into this museum called the Leitner Museum. It was really, really cool. But we did that thing where we just wandered around like aimlessly and then wound up in this exhibit of old bicycles. And the guy, like the, somebody there who actually, I believe it was his collection was there, but then there was this other guy there and we just said, oh, hey, tell us about this. And then got like the most fascinating, like 25 minute (laughs) um, dissertation about all these bicycles and the difference between a velocipede and an old fashioned bike. And the kids later said that was their favorite part of the trip. So it was like, I couldn't have done that for them. Right. Yep. We just would have wondered. Yep. And I would have probably been annoyed that they weren't more excited. So, right. yeah, because yeah. you feel pressure as a parent yeah. to make it meaningful. And we'll, we'll get into more of that, too, along the way. That's hard to avoid. I also um, I heard another parent say, and I did not do this, but it is kind of a good idea if you're the homeschooling type or you have time to do this. Um, I heard a parent who has three teens say that they had each of their kids pick a piece of art in the Louvre to research ahead of time. And kind of assigned it to them. They just Googled it or Wikipedia it. I don't think it was anything more than that. But then they had the kids kind of find their piece that they had researched beforehand and use that as kind of like the focal point. And I thought that was a clever idea, too. I think there's other ways you can break something as enormous as the Louvre down into we're not going to see it all. So how can we make the things we do see more meaningful? Yeah. Well, on the other end of enjoying beautiful historic art. I just want to say in no uncertain terms that there is such a thing as ceiling fatigue. That's what I'm calling it. Ceiling fatigue is when you reach a point where you cannot look up and be impressed by another ceiling fresco or carved. (laughs) That's what I wondered if you meant just like your neck literally hurts. You've just been looking up so much. Both. I'm going to (laughs) say both physically and spiritually. It's like that you reach a saturation where no matter how beautiful it is and how incredible it is. It kind of feels like not all the same. It's not that all the ceilings are the same, but when you do a trip like this in the beginning, you look up in these churches and these cathedrals and these palaces, and you just cannot believe that humans have created this beauty just for the sake of beauty. And it's so inspiring. And then toward the end, you're like, I don't care. It's another beautiful ceiling. And I guess I just want to normalize that because I've done a little bit of Europe travel in my 20s and Brian's done the same and we just did it with the kids. And I just don't think anybody needs to feel bad about what I am naming as ceiling fatigue. It's kind of inevitable. It's okay. I guess if there's a travel and tourism tip, it is to space out. If you're going to do a lot of cathedrals or a lot of palaces, I think spacing them out a few days apart, if you can, is helpful. And also being mindful at what what you do at the beginning of your trip versus the end, um, because there there just is a little bit of waning awe, like waning inspiration as you yeah. stare up at these beautiful ceilings. And I just think that's OK. We can't be um, equal amounts amazed at everything all the time. It's not sustainable. I'm wondering, because most of us have been in some way exposed to these these beautiful frescoes and ceilings like we've seen them on tv we've seen them in movies we we've we know they exist we've at least even if we haven't been up close and personal with them or haven't seen all of them it's like by the time you're a 42 year old woman and you've been there before but but even by the time you're like a you know 15 year old kid you at least know they exist is there something where you're thinking oh my gosh seeing it in person is going to be so much more mind blowing And it is. And yet it's not, (laughs) you know, I think for me, it's more of what I was talking about, like beginning of trip versus end of trip. I actually think sometimes it's more incredible in person than I even thought it 
was going to be. Um, especially when it's at the beginning of the trip and you know, you haven't achieved ceiling fatigue yet. There's something about um, the size that's very difficult. And obviously I'm, I'm putting a bunch of different types of buildings in one bucket here, but there's something about the size and scale that's very hard to get a sense of on an image or a screen. And so being in a physical space like Westminster Abbey um, or where else, like um, Henry VIII's palace, the Tudor Palace, Hampton Court was also near the beginning of our trip. Um, being in the physical space, I think, is absolutely mind blowing, even if you think you've gotten an idea of these things o- over the years. I think for me, it's the repetitiveness of if you fill a trip with just ceilings um, or just those kinds of ar- architectural wows, um, it just diminishes after a little while. Um, and for the kids too. So I guess the point here was that we don't need to beat ourselves up about it. it, it it's okay. It, it doesn't mean don't see it or don't, um, don't try to be impressed, but the ceilings you see at the beginning of the trip will likely blow your mind more than those at the end. Well, I think that sounds a hundred percent reasonable. Okay. And then this is kind of related, but this um, really reminded me that a lot of this type of travel uh, solidifies family culture in a way that doesn't happen at home. And sometimes it happens in unexpected ways. We realized um, pretty much on the first like major tourist attraction we went to that we just are not an audio guide family. Our experience is not enhanced by strapping those cheap headphones over our head yeah. <laughs> and having someone like voiceover uh-huh. narrate as yes, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. For me who likes to get all the information and likes to kind of follow the expectations of me, I would have gone right along and gotten all of the audio guides and handed the headphones out to my kids. And we have done a few touristy things in the States where we have, you know, gotten the audio guide and put the headphones on. And um, it wasn't until Westminster Abbey that I I was with Violet and Brian and the big kids kind of went on ahead. And I just took uh, we were she was going to do the kid audio guide and I was going to do the grown up one. We were going to try and like sync up our numbers. So like, let's go stand over here and both push number one at the same time. And it was really crowded. And we just we just abandoned it. And we just wandered around. And what and I think it was Luke who later said, like, we're just not an audio guide family. And I realized why for us. And this could be different for another family. We really like to talk to each other about what we're seeing as we're seeing it. And so, again, kind of going back to the Louvre, like we might have missed some interesting tidbits that they were telling us over the little app on the thing that they give you. But um, it takes us out of the experience of pointing out, pointing stuff out and talking to each other, maybe reading a plaque, maybe saying, oh, come over here. Look at this. Because when you're trying to move around as a family of five and everyone's listening to the audio guide, you you don't really have that option. You It's like you and the robot voice or the recorded voice on the other end. You're no longer with your people. Now, I will say if I was in a country where I didn't speak the language and I had no cultural um, touch points at all, like I didn't know anything about what I was seeing and I didn't speak the language, then then I think something like that would be really helpful. If I was traveling by myself, I could see doing an audio guide. But we just realized early on and it was so freeing to be like, nope. And like at other places, we would just completely skip the audio guide. Maybe we'd Google it on our phones or look something up. But we we found other ways to learn about what we were seeing that weren't the audio guides. Um, I am somebody who almost always avoids the audio guides. I don't know why. Probably for the same reason I avoid signing up for guided tours. But I will ask you this, because you said if you were alone in a country where you didn't speak the language or where you just wanted to be good, Sarah, Mm -hmm. like good, I'm going to show up and do the thing, Sarah, you, you might do it anyway. I'm curious in what ways you have to when you're traveling in that situation with a family of five, in what ways do you have to, or does it behoove you to let go of the way Sarah would do things, whether because you want to or not, like whether because you want to, or just because you think that's what you should do either one. Um, do you find there's just that you, because especially because you've been there before that there were things you had to remind yourself, like, this is different though. Like I'm not here as a young single woman on my own. I'm here with my family. And that means I'm going to set aside the way I yeah. travel. I think you nailed it. I think it's because I have been to these places before that I was able to do that. Um, 
if we had chosen uh, Spain, where I've never been, would like to go and don't know a lot about the art and the architecture, um, I think we probably would have had to approach that a little differently. It might have looked like I might have headed out for one attraction by myself and done it by myself if I didn't think it was a good fit for the whole family. So I do think we had on our side the fact that Brian and I had done most of the major um, attractions that we did one or both of us had done before, not all of them. Like I had never been up inside the Eiffel tower before. And we did that. That was a first for me. And I think Brian might be, hadn't been to the tower of London and he did that. But for the most part, I think we felt like we could set aside maybe some of our own like travel wishes in, in pursuit of that, like family experience because we'd been before. Gotcha. Okay. All right. And then this is probably the world's most obvious reminder, but I remembered that when traveling, wherever you go, there you are. You as a mom, a parent, and also (laughs) your family. And this came out both, I would say, in really lovely ways and challenging ways. But um, you can't expect your kids to be anyone other than who they are, even while five, six, eight time zones away from home and, you know, doing these big adventurous things. my kids still bickered about who got to sit where at a dinner table. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Um, Wherever you go, there you are. You bring yourself with you. It's a good reminder, but it also can show up in sweet ways as well. My kids are generally really kind to each other. um, And I thought we worked really well together as a unit of five. And that's an area that we've really grown in, I would say, over the last like two years at home. Um, just as like our youngest has matured a little bit and we've kind of settled into like teen and preteen life, um, we get along really well as a family of five and we do at home and we did on the road. So it's not all challenging, but if you have aspirations that, um, you know, doing these grand things will make grand humans out of your small humans, probably best to check that, check that assumption. They're going to be the same people. Mm -hmm. They as are. are you. You're you're the same family in a more stressful and unusual situation. Yeah. And sometimes that heightens things and makes even maybe not so good qualities even worse. But I also think people can really rise to the occasion. You know, I um like I bring a lot of strengths to this kind of travel planning. I'm really organized. I almost never have a show up someplace that's like closed or, you know, I read the sign wrong. Like I'm really good on the administrative and logistical details. On the flip side, I'm kind of a wimp in certain areas. I get tired easily. Um, I'm not so great at like powering through into the late evening. I can get frustrated when things don't go my way. Like I know myself, um, I know my strengths. And I think I was able to give myself mostly a lot of grace that like, okay, I'm killing it in certain areas of this trip. I'm not going to kill it in all of them and nor are my, nor are my people. Well, just getting off, like just starting was, I believe a lesson for the Sarah's, the Sarah-ness in Sarah in that you had problems just getting out the door. Yeah, we sure did. Something completely outside of your control, which then threw off your itinerary for the first 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe like half a day. Yeah. We had flight issues. Luckily the huge blessing there was that everything we dealt with was when we were, we hadn't even left our house yet when we knew that we were going to miss a connecting flight. So we actually had to redo our itinerary before we even left home. By the time we got it figured out and left home, we flew out of a completely different airport, got there a different way. It only really set us back probably about five or six hours in the landing, in the arriving there. But yeah, it was a scramble. Yeah. Yeah. So look at me. I practice being flexible. (laughs) We are welcoming back Dr. Mom Butt Balm as a sponsor today. And Megan, I guess you must be back to changing diapers again, right? Now that you have a step grandbaby in the mix. I have changed a few lately, Sarah. And yeah, it really takes me back to that memory from early motherhood. I actually always enjoyed diaper changes unless they were the really gross toddler ones or if there was diaper rash involved. Oh my gosh, yes. I remember being so stressed out, like gearing up for the saddest diaper change ever. Your baby knows it's going to hurt. You know they're going to cry. It is just the worst. And having to use goopy, gross diaper rash cream definitely didn't help. 
Dr. Mom Butt Balm was developed by a mom who's also a doctor when she couldn't find any traditional products that worked for her baby's persistent diaper rash. This pediatrician-approved formula is made with all quality ingredients and no artificial dyes or preservatives. And since it's easy to remove, you won't have to wipe and wipe to get it off of your baby's skin. That is so important, especially if they're already a little chafed. And I love the way this formula feels. A little goes a long way. Don't let diaper rash come between you and your baby. Shop for Dr. Mom Butt Balm online at Amazon or Walmart today. Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids' diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar, they have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them, and I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution, Haya, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full-body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash mom hour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Okay, so these are some things that I guess I learned or some ahas I had that I think I'm going to take back home into regular parenting and maybe listeners um, feel like they might apply as well, because while I realized them abroad across the pond, um, I think they really apply generally to family life. The first one was an on the fly invention I came up with, I think on like the first full day, maybe the second full day. Um, And while it was specific to travel for us, I think it could be really useful for busy families, even at home. And I called it, you know, I like to give things a name. I called it our one hand itinerary for the day. The kids later changed that to the five finger itinerary and then (laughs) kept making jokes about five finger (laughs) discounts and shoplifting. And I don't know. I'm calling it the one hand itinerary. And here's what this was. I realized that um, a great character defect of mine is I give way too much information. If someone asks a simple question, especially my children, I am tempted to give them way more information than they need. And then they tune out and don't remember any of it. So whilst traveling, if someone said, mom, what are we doing today? What's the schedule for today? I might take that as an opportunity to be like, well, you know, I thought about taking the bus, but I think we're actually going to take the tube. And I was <laughs> like, just tell me what up. I need to know, right. mom. <laughs> tell me what I need to know. Exactly. So I thought I'm going to, I'm going to give these kids an itinerary each day, verbally, just verbally, not a printout that is no more than five fingers, but preferably less, pre- preferably like three or four things. And I'm going to expect them to remember it. So their end of the bargain is I'm going to give you the three or four or five things you need to know, then you don't get to ask me again, ask each other or rack your brain, but you are responsible for remembering. So I don't have to answer, what are we doing after this? Or are we doing this today or tomorrow? Like that is your job. Then if you really want to know, like, how are we getting there? Or what's the plan for lunch? Or will I have time to go to the gift shop? Like, then I can engage with those questions along the way. And we can talk about those, but don't ask me what we're doing next. Like you, you can keep three or four or five things in your brain. And it worked really, really well. And the, the itineraries would be like one word times three or four. So it would be like train palace, um, six, the musical I'm thinking of one day in particular. So train palace six, which was the musical that we saw dinner. That was that was the four things they needed to remember. Of course, we did other things. How did we get there? Where did we eat? What did we do about lunch? Like, when did we rest? Um, And some things had like three things. Sometimes it was like Eiffel Tower, New Year's Eve or something like that. So that worked really, really great. I think I could take this into normal life, especially during busy seasons of life. 
and just not give my kids so much information, but also hold them accountable for remembering the very basics. It's I I'm just so fascinated by this because I think if you asked my kids, they would say that I never give them enough information. Yeah. And I think it's because I'm weary just thinking about communicating it all to them and then realizing they won't remember it anyway. So I yeah. I speak in guttural grunts, gr- like grunts, yeah. essentially. Um, and Eric, and I know you and Eric have a lot in common, will sometimes tell me so much about how he got to a decision that he never actually tells me what, like sometimes I'll ask him a question and he ends up only telling me the things he didn't decide. Yeah. I I relate. (laughs) He shares all the thought process and then he kind of trails off and I'm like, wait, I know. And then we get mad because we think you're not listening. And I know (laughs) I'm sorry. Did you ever tell me what I need? I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's okay. You don't have to apologize. I, it's such an interesting difference in the way that people communicate. It's like I get really frustrated when someone gives me more information than I need or want um, or can process. So then I overcompensate for that by giving way less. Yeah. And probably I'm sure there's a happy medium somewhere, right? Well, and we can grow. I've gotten not just on this trip, but I have really gotten mindful in the last year or so of when my kids ask me a question, especially in the car, because I have a captive audience and I like to talk and I like to explain things. And I'm like, I'll catch myself. I'll be like, okay, you asked me a short question and I'm giving you a really long answer. And they'll, now we have like a good rapport about it. Like I'm not defensive. It doesn't hurt my feelings. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to give you a short answer because that's probably what you want. (laughs) So that's all that's required. I can improve. I can improve. But man, this was really effective. And I think even if you were doing like a quick domestic trip, like not a big travel, but kids being out of their element and kind of wanting to know what to expect, um, they don't need all the details and they won't remember all the details. So they'll just keep coming back to you. So it's in, it's in your best interest too, uh, moms and dads to give them the old one hand itinerary, no more than five things to remember, but then make them remember it. And then they can connect the dots. Yeah. Or they can ask follow-ups. Yeah. And I think what's it's nice to, to know that if you lay out five dots, big rocks, uh, brass tacks, mm-hmm. whatever, that the filling in can happen on the fly. And they'll kind of learn, too, that like sometimes things don't go exactly the way mom laid right. it out mm-hmm. in the 15,000 point plan. It may actually be that the only things that actually happen are the five things. Right. Yeah. And the way all the stuff in the middle happens is going to look different than you could ever you could ever anticipate anyway. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And they, there's three of them. They care about different things. Like some of them care a lot about where we eat. Some of them don't. So they don't need all of that information. And you're right. Then when things don't go according to plan, it's less to revise if they didn't even know what was supposed to happen anyway. So do you have okay, I'm, I know that you do. And I don't even know why I'm phrasing it this way. <laughs> I bet you have at least one kid where when if something doesn't go exactly the way you said, they'll just stand there and be like, but you said, mm-hmm. but you said, and you're like, I know, but that's not true. Move on. Yep. Mm-hmm. Move along. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, and I'm just going to get into uh, the next few things have to do with, I guess, arbitrating all kinds of those little uh, debates and um, switching of gears. But yes, I do. Uh, overall, I think my kids, they must have read the room because they were more flexible and less um, rigidly attached to anything than I thought they would be on this trip. So that was really good. Um. Well, this next one. <laughs> Uh, is really about how to navigate small disagreements or differences of opinions or even just like that thing we were talking about at the beginning, which is like whose needs matter most in this moment and what's the collective decision. Um, so the the little nugget is when in doubt, vote or take turns. And it sounds so simple, but I can tell you it was like a big aha for me. So I'm going to tell two little stories. So before we left, I was in a therapy session talking to my therapist and I was talking about how I had done all this like very detailed work getting ready for the trip, but that I, I aspired to kind of let go and go with the flow for the most part once we were on the trip. And I was talking about navigating five people's wants and needs and desires and this very thing that we've been talking about. Um, and she said, so, she was asking like, well, how do you usually you know, navigate those types of small things. We're not talking about big decisions. We're talking about like, hey guys, should we eat now or should we wait 30 minutes and eat across town? Like the the small decisions. And I was like, well, I usually like 
kind of figure out what's best. And I started this whole line of talking about basically, I think I know what's best for everyone. And I put it on myself to be the decider, which yes, has a lot of control, but also like it's a lot of mental load to do it that way. She's like, what if you took a vote like majority rules? And I was like, why don't we ever take a vote? Like we really don't do majority rules in our family very often. Now, I don't think it's the way to navigate every family decision. There are plenty of decisions, especially if you have really little kids, you're not going to put it to a vote. Like mom and dad are going to decide what's best for the family. So not always, but sometimes majority rules like blew my mind. And so we did use that with little things where it was like the, the, it was relatively inconsequential, but no matter what, somebody was going to be disappointed. Right. I mean, mildly disappointed. So rather than me be the one to decide like who's, who's Who gotten their way yeah, like who's yeah. gotten their way more lately, who's kind of having a rough day, who, whose disappointment do I least want to deal with? Those are the type, that's the type of mental gymnastics I would typically do. And she was like, how about like majority rules? And I was like, Whoa, mind blown. It's like, hey, Sarah, how about <laughs> like you, you have an odd number, so you actually can right. in a group of five. I don't know. Do your kids ever vote on something, Megan? Um, gosh, I think in my family at this point, it's the strongest rule. Like, I think it's the strongest personalities that get their way. If yeah. it's the kind of thing where it even gets to that point when they were younger, I would do stuff like that. Take a vote. Yeah, um, I had to. Because yes. otherwise, just like you said, like, how would I know who, who to favor, who to, the, if, and my kids would all accuse me of favoring the baby of the yeah. family yep. always. And honestly, I probably yes, did sometimes totally. or the one who acted like the ba- biggest baby, you know? Yeah. So, um, yes, I think now it's a little different now because there's adult kids and I don't, I'm not really the one always sort of, um, it's the word I'm looking for. I'm not managing the decision making as much. It's like it's happening and I'm just going yeah. along with it a lot of the time. So that's a little bit different. Yeah. And I again, I by no means mean that this is the solution to every family argument. It's just kind of funny that it didn't even occur to me and that I really did think it was my job to know how to um, hand down the ultimate decision on even little stuff, which is a lot of it's a lot of work for me. So I guess that was an aha for me when in doubt vote or take turns. And so here's where we brought back. Um, uh, we dusted off an old family system called choose day. Like you choose, it's your choice for the day. Choose day just rotates Luke, Reed, Violet, Luke, Reed, Violet. You just rotate through. And when it is your day, you get to choose the small stuff. Like who sits by the window when we get on the bus? It's a lot of sitting. My kids have a lot of yeah. opinions on where they sit. And you would think they would have outgrown this, Megan, but they have not at 15, 13, and almost 11. So Tuesday is useful for, um, yeah, where who gets to sit where in a taxi or on a bus or on a boat. We, we rode on many vehicles. Um, I don't know who gets the last like candy bar at the bottom of the backpack. I'm trying to think of the other small things that are decided by a person having the designated Tuesday, but it is very useful. And I could tell right at the beginning of our trip that these micro arguments were going to really bother me. They were going to get, they were going to like kill my vibe a little bit. And so I brought back Tuesday and they kind of thought like it was more what we did when they were little kids, but I'm telling you it worked. It just, it took the small arguments away. And yes, the other two would be disappointed if it wasn't their day to choose the thing. But guess what? I also didn't get super triggered by the fact that 15 and 13 year olds are arguing about who gets to sit in which seat in a restaurant. So I was the ultimate winner and they got to wait their turn and everybody got at least two of special Tuesdays during the trip. And it was perfect. I have to ask if there were any jokes made because my kids love to say Tuesday the way that it is sometimes said in British television where it's Tuesday. Uh huh. Tuesday. Yeah. Did you do that? Because you were in England. I know. And there was someone probably had a Tuesday on a Tuesday, but I don't know if we made (laughs) that joke. Tuesday. We were Um, too busy arguing (laughs) over who got to sit where. Well, I also have to say that I think there's probably something to your family's dynamics where at least one of those kids doesn't actually care where they sit, but they have to participate in the row. 
let's yeah. say, just because, like, because the other two are right. Yeah. It's like you're you you're gonna scramble for your seat or press the elevator button or whatever, yeah. not because you care, but because that's what you do. And there's somebody so like letting one person just choose takes all the it takes all the steam out of it. Yes. It does. And it rota- it rotates it fairly back to like majority yeah. rules. Like it's not that everybody's happy, but everybody is guaranteed their day of less disappointment and their day of more disappointment. And I'm going to guess the 15 year old who doesn't get to, you know, sit in the chosen seat probably isn't that disappointed. It's like because there was never the option of them choosing that yeah. day. It like removes them having to care. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was very useful and we abandoned it as soon as we got home. It's not necessary anymore in our, in our day-to-day life, but, um, there was a time when it was, and it was in play, like literally all the time who gets to, um, have the pink cup who gets to, you know, you remember those, those days. So that was a good one to bring back. Okay. This next one is something I've been thinking about (laughs) as we've re-entered and I've, as I've been thinking back on this trip and I have thought to myself, oh my gosh, this the stuff I thought was going to be so challenging parenting wise, um, just for myself, the travel itself went better than I expected. And then I'm sitting here five days into reentry being like, oh my gosh, this is so much harder than I was anticipating. And I think it's just true that when you take on any major undertaking, some things are going to be easier than you feared they would be. And other things are going to be harder than you imagined they would be. And you just kind of have to take the wins and accept the defeats and trust that it it will even out in the end. I mean, rarely have I been on a trip where we sailed through completely without challenge, nor have I been on a trip that just was a total disaster. It's just that because I like to predict and control things, it's never what I expect will be easy. The easy things are harder than I think, and the hard things are easy, go better than I think. Do you find that you focus more on the things that went harder than you thought or the things that went easier than you expected? Well, I think I'm pretty good at moving through either way. I, I do really love when something goes better than expected. Like I want, I want to like talk about it and like, I want Brian to also talk about it and be like, that was like so perfect. Like we nailed that day. Yeah. Um, so I think a little bit of both. I probably wallow in a little bit of both, but I can move through. I was going to say that I think for me, one of the things, I, one of my growth opportunities that I'm realizing as I become a older lady is I'm wired toward noticing when things went better than expected mm-hmm. and then sort of not acknowledging the impact it has on me when things don't go as well as expected. Like I just gloss over that. Yeah. And you want don't to move, realize move that, on. Right. And then I don't realize that that's why I'm so exhausted or yeah. that's why I'm grumpy. Like, oh, it's because there was this disaster in the middle of the day and we all survived. Sure. But it had, a t- it took a toll on all of us. Yeah. Um, and I, I tend to be like, well, that's behind now. Like that's behind us now. And all these other things went right. And we should just, I guess, you know, get with the program or lighten up and, yeah. um, That I really have realized is not a realistic expectation to have of myself or others. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm I'm pretty squarely like a realist and a pragmatist, but I can get really stuck in frustration when something I thought was not going to be that big a deal becomes a big deal. But I'm I'm growing. I'm getting better. Uh, On that note, I do want to say that I I wrote down exactly what we did and what happened every day at the either at the end of the day or early in the morning the next day. And it was so interesting because that's not the same as an itinerary. Like the itinerary is like a journal almost or a log. This was a log. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, I had the itinerary of what we thought we were going to do. But I logged what actually happened, including things like what time we woke up and went to bed because we were dealing with jet lag and tired and um, where we ate and what we ate. And so I have that. I haven't really done anything with it. But that's also helpful when what you're talking about, you kind of look back and you either amplify or aggrandize one aspect and minimize the other. And I, I tend to be, I think kind of a, like a a realist somewhere in the middle, but it's helpful to have the actual data because you can be like, Oh my gosh, that was so hard. And then you kind of look back at photos or your journal and you're like, okay, well, but we did it, you know, or vice versa. And was it, was it so hard or like, did it feel that hard in the minute? And yeah, what actually happened? I think that's really smart. Yeah. Well, my last one, um, kind of, I I put this in the category of this applies all year round, not just on your European vacations, but it truly like 
felt very um, poignant to me while we were traveling. And I'd like to bring it into regular life. And that is, I was very tempted to want my kids to be impressed by things we saw, buildings and skylines and, um, you know, just the grandeur of everything we were seeing. Um, But as we've touched on in this episode, you can't make people feel something that you want them to feel. We can only feel what we feel. And there were a couple of times when I found myself experiencing like pure delight or being very moved by something. And my kids got to see me having that experience. And I think that was as important and as meaningful as if they had been blown away by something. So if there's advice in there, it is to let your kids see you having genuine, authentic emotional experiences and being delighted by things and being moved by things, they're going to be delighted and surprised and wowed by things in their life. And all you have to do is model that that human experience exists, that it's accessible to them. They don't have to be blown away on this trip by this thing. It will, they'll, they'll figure out what blows them away. So the two, the two times it happened, the first was on our, actually it wasn't the first, I I flipped the order, but the first one I remembered was on our, we took the train from London to Paris through the channel. Um, and we splurged for like the business class or just like one level above coach. And so there was a meal served on the train and like, Megan, you would have loved it. It was breakfast and it arrived like on a tray. Just you talking about this and like breakfast on a train. On a train with the table in front of you with like a real coffee mug. And we were going from England to France and sidebar the cough, the difference in coffee in England versus France is like not even in the same conversation already. The coffee was better, like, because we were headed toward France and it was like in a real mug and there was like real silverware and Violet was across from me and she loves this kind of stuff too, but she could just tell I was like a little kid having breakfast on a train with my tiny coffee mug and my little spoon. And she just said, I can't remember what she said later, but she could tell that mom was like living her best life eating breakfast on a train. And so that was really cute. Um, and then separately, when we were at Westminster Abbey, there's a to- the, there is a tomb of the unknown soldier. Um, and the kids were kind of reading the plaque. It was right after we abandoned the audio book guide and, um, or the audio guide. And the kids were reading the plaque. And one of them asked me a question or something. And I started to explain kind of the significance of the idea of a tomb of the unknown soldier. And I was like crying, like literally like mm. tears falling down my face. And they just kind of sat there and they listened to me and I felt a little silly. It was like kind of an outsized emotional reaction, but I was having trouble explaining this concept in this space in front of this tomb of the unknown soldier. And, and I thought later, like that was, that was really good. Like they don't have to have been moved by that. They're maybe not like mature, like their wise maturity wise, but they have seen that that is possible, especially through travel and especially through seeing different things in the world. So I was grateful for that. And I think that's true in regular life too, that we want our kids to see us having to be see, to see us be blown away by things. I've become pretty unabashed about being emotional in front of my kids. And I had to become comfortable with them, like poking fun at me a little bit, mm-hmm. like a, a good natured. No, yeah. My kids aren't like ah, laughing at me or right mom's an idiot. It's more just like, I'll get a little ribbing. Like there, there goes mom again. Oh boy. You know, and I've had to allow that as part of the experience because they're learning and it might make them a little uncomfortable. Like if they're in a stage of life where they're still cool in front of their friends and it's not something they're used to, to show emotion. And then you do that. There's like this, uh, what do I do with this moment? And I've just, learned because I can be a little defensive and be like, you guys don't get it. And yeah. blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, and it's not like I'm having crazy fits or anything. No. I'm just sh- crying or yeah. like whatever I'm getting choked up or whatever the thing is. And just having to say, okay, you can make fun of me. That's fine. And that's been a growth thing for me because I do think it's really healthy yeah. for them to see that. And again, like, like you said, we can't expect them to have the same experience right. as us, but they learn just by watching us yeah. have an experience. Yeah. Well, um, now I'm almost ready to try this all again and go back. <laughs> How many years? How many more years? Um, talk to me when I have fully adjusted to um, my proper time zone. 
Um, it was a giant undertaking. It was really challenging yeah. and I'm really glad we did it. I'm very grateful that we had the opportunity to do it. Um, I can be a little timid when it comes to taking on big things like this, but I'm glad we did it. Well, I'm glad you did it. I loved getting the updates and the photos and just hearing about your stories. And I actually really loved hearing your, I guess, sort of parenting realizations as well. This was really fun. Very fun. Well, before we wrap, um, I would like to put out a call for listener questions. You all know that we take your parenting challenges and mom life related listener questions or really any questions you want to throw at us. And we um, answer those in episodes every so often. So let's start the year with um, a fresh batch of questions from our listener community. You can email us your question to hello at the momhour.com. That's probably the easiest way. You can also record your voice and email that to us at the same address. Hello at the momhour.com. And we would love to take your questions in a future episode. Yeah, we're looking forward to hearing from you. I always love hearing people's voices. Me too. Me too. All right, everyone. We will talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to The Mom Hour. Everything we talked about in today's episode is available at themomhour.com. And hey, while you're there, you can find more than 500 podcast episodes, plus articles, playlists, and resources about motherhood and parenting at every stage. And if you like today's episode, we'd love it if you would take a minute to share the show with another mom in your life. You can also find us on Instagram at The Mom Hour, chatting and interacting with listeners between episodes. Thanks for being here, friends. We'll talk to you soon. The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like Chatbooks. Chatbooks makes it beyond easy to create beautiful photo books by importing your digital photos from anywhere, Instagram, Facebook, Google Photos, or directly from your phone. The books come in a variety of sizes with beautiful cover options and binding styles to choose from, and they start at just $15. Plus, we have a great deal just for our listeners. Use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20% off your purchase. Just download the Chatbooks app and use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20%. Hey, everyone, we have a favor to ask. If you are an Apple Podcasts user, can you check really quickly to make sure you're still following the Mom Hour? Apple did one of their big software updates recently, and it changed a bunch of things about how you get the podcasts you're subscribed to. If Apple Podcasts is your podcast app of choice, all you have to do is find your way to our show page and then click the little plus sign or follow in the top right corner. Thanks so much.